everyone. Welcome into the scoreboard. I'm your host, Blake O'Rulian. We have a great show for you today. We'll take a look at the vision behind the cycle effect. We'll bring you fly fishing reports and we meet Eagle Valley High School volleyball coach Michael Garvey. Up first, part one of my interview with coach Michael Garvey. Hey everyone, right now we are joined by head coach of Eagle Valley Volleyball, head coach Michael Garvey. Coach, thank you so much for being here today. You bet, thanks for having us. Of course, hey, and so it's currently the off season and I wanted to ask you a little bit about how this summer's been going. How is preparation going into this 2022 season? Uh, so far, so good. Uh, it's actually been uh, my third year as the head coach and uh, hopefully my first normal year with uh, no COVID. So last summer was a short summer. Uh, obviously the one prior to that was uh, interesting with all of our COVID regulations, not being able to be in a gym. So uh, we had our freshmen come in in the beginning of May when they can first join us and ran through till the end of school. And now we're just getting ready to ramp back up again for the summer. Yeah, you mentioned it's your third season as the head coach, and I wanted to ask you a little bit about what are some of the things that you've learned? It's been kind of a roller coaster considering that COVID's been happening the entire duration that you've been there. And so I wanted to ask you, what are some of the things that you've learned as a coach uh, because of all of the different things that have been going on? Yeah, you know, I, I felt really fortunate. This was uh, my 25th season coaching and uh, really just fortunate that I had some background in coaching and background in working with kids and so forth. So that when this wrinkle was thrown at us, uh, we were able to handle it and it wasn't brand new for us. So uh, definitely had to keep an eye on um, our athletes' emotions. Uh, it seemed that it didn't take a whole lot to get us rocked. Uh, we definitely had our time, uh, both seasons, we had some time off with COVID with both coaches and players. And so it's just a good reminder to make sure that you're checking in with your athletes that you know what their uh, mental state is and how they're doing. And um, just important that you know them as players. Yeah, 25 seasons coaching volleyball overall. And I wanted to ask you, we want to get to know the team, but we also want to get to know you. So could you tell us a little bit about your volleyball background as well? Sure, uh, began playing in high school. And uh, mostly then it was just kind of the beach and grass scene. So uh, just kind of get introduced to the sport that way. Uh, in college, again, continued uh, with kind of a love of the game, taking classes and being involved, playing and so forth. Got my first head coaching position uh, at Vail Mountain School and coached there for 18 seasons. Uh, then moved over to Eagle Valley and spent a couple of years as the JV coach uh, and now as a head coach. And have been coaching club since, I believe, 99. Um, so a little bit of a mixed bag all up here in the Vail Valley. So uh, my coaching experience is kind of limited to uh, the Vail experience, but it's been great. That is unbelievable. That's a very long time at one specific high school, too. How much did you learn from 18 years at one school? And possibly, if I may ask this, how long do you think you want to stay at Eagle Valley? Do you think you want to be there for 18 years as well? How much longer do you want to coach? Uh, right now, I don't see an end to it. Um, it was a little transition period between Vail Mountain School and Eagle Valley that kind of uh, refreshed me and let me know that I, I did want to continue coaching. Um, my daughter's coming into the program this year, so hope to at least stick out four more years with her. And um, I love it. I love coaching. I love working with kids. And so right now, uh, as I said, I, I don't see uh, I don't see any movement. So hopefully uh, they're at Eagle Valley for quite a while. Yeah, coach, you actually, speaking of, of new players coming in, uh, realistically, players have to leave as well. Last season, you lost 10 seniors. And I wanted to ask you, how have the adjustments been made? And, and you know, when you have so many seniors that leave the program, it's kind of a tough thing for, for the new juniors and, and the sophomores of last year to kind of step up. How have they been adjusting to that uh, new change? You know, we mentioned it as we get going in the spring, uh, I kind of pull each uh, rising senior uh, off and kind of remind them of, you know, when you start to look around and you look for somebody to lead, uh, it's you that needs to step up. And so we've already started that process. Uh, we're going to a couple of team camps and we're going to do some scrimmages here uh, in, a, in a couple weeks. So this will be their opportunity uh, to rise up and kind of adjust into that role. We found in the past that uh, we do a lot of work with our teams mixing together. 
So they get to be with those previous seniors and they get to see their leadership. And many of them have already talked about uh, the leaders that they wanna be. So it usually goes uh, pretty smooth. And it's it just kind of a natural evolution of the next people and the, the next person. After the break, Coach Garvey talks about how they are getting ready for their upcoming season. Stay with us here. We will be right back on the scoreboard. Welcome back to The Scoreboard. I'm your host, Blake O'Rooley, and before the break, we saw part one of my interview with head coach Michael Garvey, the volleyball coach over at Eagle Valley High School. Let's see part two of that interview right now. I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about camps and things like that. Obviously, there is some sort of a summer camp getting prepared for the season itself. How have summer camps been going? Is there anyone that's really stuck out for you? Uh, you know, we really haven't gotten going yet. We've mostly had open gyms. And so it's been a, a mixed bag of young and old kids coming in and uh, we get going. Uh, we'll go up to uh, University of Northern Colorado here on the 14th of July and then to CSU. And uh, we've got Glenwood Springs and Battle Mountain coming over for a little scrimmage in a couple weeks. So uh, we're waiting to see uh, who's going to step up and uh, who those leaders are going to be. So um, that's kind of our goal in the summer is to start that process so that when we get started in the season, we're not uh, starting from square one that we've kind of got the ball rolling and we know where we want to be on that first day of uh, practice. That'll be so interesting also to have your daughter in the program. Is she going to be on the varsity level or is she going to be on the JV or freshman level? No, she's, uh, she's got to work to earn her spot just like everybody else. So um, we'll have uh, four teams this year, which will be new. And uh, I think as things go out, you know, I think she's just going to be happy to be a part of the program. Um, We've worked together in club. Uh, I've coached her as a club athlete, so it's not going to be new to us uh, working together, but uh, it's going to be a, interesting to have her in the program and, and see her every day uh, on the volleyball court as an athlete and not just uh, my daughter at home. Are there any other players that you know that are coming up right now through the club scene that you know are going to be on this team? Any players that specifically stand out that maybe the audience should uh, be checking out and making sure that, that they know who they are as the season kicks off? You know, I think we're fortunate to bring back a few players, um, you know, that played last year and played a significant time. Uh, CJ Yersak and uh, Talia Crawford were both starters and, and, and played a ton. So they will be a big impact for us this year. Uh, but we've got, a, again, a number of other players that, um, that played with us all season in practices um, that, again, are, are, I think are going to step right into those roles at the varsity level. You placed second in league for the last two seasons as a head coach, which is a very good feat considering how this team has kind of gone from, from the highest of highs to the lowest of lows over the last couple of years. So I wanted to ask you, where do you think this team can end up at the end of this season? Do you have high hopes to win league and maybe go as far uh, into a state championship or something like that? Uh, I definitely think this team um, can win the league. Uh, as you stated, we, um, we split with Palisade last year, who were the the league champs. Um, we took a loss to Glenwood, which uh, took us out of kind of a, a, a tie for that. And the season before, we only had one loss to Palisade. And in our short season, uh, that was all it took to, to not be the league champions. So we're right there uh, with those teams at the top of the league. Uh, I feel we bring back enough athletes uh, to compete again. And this year, you know, we, we've fallen short the last couple seasons to punch our ticket to the state tournament. And so that's definitely a goal this year is to take one more step and get ourselves to compete at the state tournament. What are some of the keys to get to the state tournament? Obviously winning games, but what are some of the specific things that you'd like this team to work on uh, throughout the season to get there to peak at the right moment? Sure. Um, I think the, you know, the one thing is, is, is keeping a good mindset. We've done a great job of that the last couple seasons with the um, uh, issues at hand with, with COVID and the different changes. Uh, this program did a really good job of making sure that, that they knew where their head was. And so I think that's going to be another key this year is, is always to be making sure that you're focused on the right things at the right time. Uh, when we look into the game itself and, and the skills, we need to continue to be a, a great serve and serve receive team. Again, a couple of our strengths uh, in the past season. And one thing that we've uh, already been focusing on this year is uh, a, a better hitting percentage. Uh, simply put, we made too many errors attacking last season. And so that's going to be a focus of ours this year. 
Well, Coach, thank you so much for the time. We really appreciate it. And good luck uh, for the rest of the summer as camps kick off. And also, good luck for this regular season. We can't wait to continue to cover it. All right. Thanks for having us on. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Welcome back to the scoreboard. Up next, Good Morning Vale host Kevin Shields had the opportunity to sit down with the Cycle Effect, whose mission is to provide young women with equal opportunity and access to the sport of mountain biking. Let's hear more. Welcome back to Good Morning Vale. I'm sitting here on the couch with Brett and Coco to talk about the Cycle Effect. Now, Brett, tell me a little bit about the Cycle Effect. Sure. So we're an Eagle County based nonprofit. Um, we help young women ages 10 to 18 ride and race mountain bikes. Um, we also have programming in Summit County, Mesa County, and Route County now. So we're going to work with about 315 young women and we will provide them absolutely everything they need to ride bikes. So that is the bikes, um, shoes, nutrition, race entries, all that kind of stuff. But then really the key thing is we offer 80 to 100 days of practice a year. And so these are paid coaches, they are professional coaches, they are mentors um, to these young women. And that's really, I think, what sets our program apart. It's not a, a week-long camp. It's, it's really a, a year-long lifestyle, and we hope to get those kids riding bikes enough that when they go to college, they're taking their bikes with them to college and things like that. And what we've really found is... Um, Kind of our, our niche is working with the BIPOC community and the, especially the Latinx community in, our, in these surrounding mountain towns. So 70% right. of our girls um, generally do identify as BIPOC or, or Latinx. And then we also have some other um, kids that have some financial need and, and things like that. So we really focus on kind of that underrepresented and under-resourced community um, to try to get into the sport. Yeah, you hit a good term there. Uh, Dan and I were talking earlier about we live in a world-class area. And when you talk about lifestyle, you kind of hit the nail on the head. That's what it's about. And yep. bikes aren't cheap. And getting the opportunity and actually coaching people on how to do it is essential. So, Coco, where do you come into play on this? Well, I've been a part of the program since I was 13. Now yeah. I'm, what, 25? Uh, so <laughs> I've been with it for a while now, and now I sit in their board of directors. Um, I'm one of the members, I guess. She, uh, she's now my boss. <laughs> wow. That's great. So Couldn't it's kind of it nice just to see the full circle I did. But, yeah, I've been a part of the program for a while now, so my sister did it as well. Um, yeah, but it's amazing. I... I don't know what to say, you know. Uh, it's a program that really helped me during my teenage years, I guess, when everything is changing, you're becoming an adult. But um, just having that access to a mountain bike, like you said, like it being totally free. Like I remember Brett came up and was like, hey, who wants to join? And we're like, 10 of us were like, oh, heck yeah, we'll do it. Um, and from there, it's grown to such a huge program now. Um, and seeing so many girls be a part of it, Back then, it's, it was a little bit more different because there wasn't as many girls, but just seeing right. the outgrown is really cool. Yeah, at the ripe old age of 25, I was going <laughs> to ask you, being, being in this program for a while, how has it morphed and how many more girls have you been able to get on board and get, allow this yeah. experience to? Well, the big difference is there was only 10 of us when we started. And yeah. we were, what, in eighth grade? And now the program has kind of grown its capacity. Now the youngest can be what? So f fifth grade is where we start, yeah, and now we'll start. have 315 girls in our in our main program, which is what Coco grew up with. And then there's a couple yeah. other ancillary programs that we've started um, yeah. that are pretty cool. But yeah, so 10 to 315, essentially, yeah. if we're comparing apples to apples. Yeah. 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 So being a nonprofit, um, yeah. obviously, you rely on outside funds to keep this going. What kind of programs do you have? Are there volunteer donation sure. opportunities? Yep. So a couple of different things. We... Um, we're always looking for great coaches, um, which generally means somebody's ridden a mountain bike before. Some people yeah. haven't, and they really are just great, you know, mentors or teachers or something that looking to, to get involved. So that's a, a great way if somebody wants to be outside actually working with kids. Um, if they 
are looking for other opportunities. We are, we just launched a bike match program, which means that we are bringing in used bikes from the community, recycling them with our mechanics, and then getting them out to applicants that are in need of, of bikes, whether that's our girls or their families, or community members that just need a bike to commute, or you know a number of other reasons. So um, if people have used bikes, like we're accepting those, we're starting slowly, because in the first week we had 300 people apply to get a bike and we had like a hundred wow. bikes donated so that we're like whoa so so again if we will get to those people you know if, if people fill out our stuff online right. we'll get there it's just that that part program just took off a lot faster than we thought it did, was going to um and then of course uh you know people can volunteer with us at events we don't have a ton of events like a lot of, a lot of other nonprofits around here mm -hmm. um we're pretty kind of bare bones in that in, in that respect but um and then the other way is financial funding. You know, we're always, right. the, these bikes aren't free. People, to, to have great people show up and coach these girls is not free in any way. So right now we're actually running our biggest um, online uh, finance, sorry, fundraising campaign um, with a $125,000 match right now. Um, and we're, it's, it's running through the next couple weeks. Um, and so you could get on our website, watch some pretty powerful videos um, that we have made for this campaign and then, um, yeah, if, if people choose, they can obviously support us financially. Yeah, up on the screen right now, it shows a picture of uh, donate and double right. your impact. So yeah. great yeah. opportunity for somebody to get in now and really make a good impact in the organization. Now, what is the website? Uh, the, www, obviously, thecycleeffect.org. Okay. Yeah. So you're out there with everything yeah. on there, all the events that you're doing and opportunities. Yeah. How many coaches do you have right now? Yeah, so when we started, I mean, it was my wife and I literally kind of running it out of our garage, right? I mean, <laughs> when, you, when you start something, you're, doing, you, you're wearing many different hats. Um, we're now a staff of 10 full-time people and 40 to 50 part-time coaches, um, and that's throughout all our different counties. Our, the, the bulk of our work is here in Eagle County. Just um, That's where it started, and, and we have you know, the most girls here. Uh, but we, again, we do have full-time staff in these other counties as well that are helping us run a, a great program. Great, and it, uh, up on the screen right now, it shows full-time staff. Oh yeah, look at us. Looks like a couple dogs on there, on the. Well, so yeah, <laughs> my, my wife is really the, the face of the organization for sure. I help run it, but Tam and my dog are definitely yep. better known in the Valley than I am, right. for sure. Awesome, well you got a great staff. Look at all the people there. Eagle County team yeah. coming up, wonderful. Yeah. It is always growing, that's Good. for sure. Well, and to, to hear about the need to have 300 people register, that's a wonderful thing, yeah. a wonderful problem to have. Yeah. And, and, you know, the other kind of things we've done is we talk about this group of 315 girls. Again, it started from 10. We're also getting into schools and working with another six to 800 kids, just giving them an opportunity to ride a bike, whether it's through their gym class or through some other programming, like with other great nonprofits like girl power under VVF and things like that, we, um, we certainly are going to be working with more than that 315. That's just kind of our core focus. And then we have a, a Latina women's mountain bike team that, you know, we, I, I was approached by yeah. a, a neighborhood navigator at one point a few, a few years ago. She said, will you help coach uh, some women how to ride bikes? I was like, I don't know Spanish. Wow. Yeah. And she's like, well, that's okay because some of them I don't know English, so this is going to be great. So we really showed up, and every Tuesday we've been doing it, and now we have a coach that clearly can communicate much better. But it's been such a powerful and impactful um, space to allow these women that are, you know, working their jobs, and then they yeah. just want to get out and giggle on their bikes and, you know, work hard and stuff like that. So yeah. we've got a lot of different little things that we all think help us recruit yeah. these girls. Well, impact is what you're doing. And yes. if our viewers are interested in getting in there, lending a hand to the cycle effect, don't forget, go to their website, see what opportunities exist, because this is an amazing opportunity, especially right now, to double your impact. So go on the website and check everything out on the wonderful things that's happening with the cycle effect. We'll be back soon with more Good Morning Vale. Welcome back to the scoreboard. It's time for your weekend fly fishing report with our resident expert, Mark Sassy of Minturn Anglers. I'm down here on the Eagle River. I wanted to give everybody a quick fishing update, let you know where we stand now. I know I've been doing this all spring, early summer, every Friday, and it's been uh, early spring. The fishing was great because our water levels were pretty low. Then the snow started to melt. 
And as we can see by looking at the river today, if you were to look at this same shot this day last year, probably that big rock out there in the middle would be fully exposed. We have a lot of water still flowing in our rivers right now. They are getting to a point where they're more accessible to wade fish, where that means you can walk around on the shorelines. Uh, but I actually went out and fished last night and I was absolutely floored by still how much water we have. Now, right in this area right here in Avon, there's a water treatment plant downstream. Uh, we get our river flows as one of our spots from that area. Flows in Avon are stabilized at about 600 cubic feet per second right now. This time last year, they were easily half of that. So this is really good for the fishing community moving into the rest of the summer. Um, these flows are gonna gradually drop down even more. When the flows get lower, the water temperatures go up and that promotes all the bugs to hatch. There's a lot of different bugs around on any given day when that sun is out and it's nice and warm. We've got caddis flies, we have stone flies, and then we have mayflies, and then a little bit of everything in between. I was gonna show you one of the rigs that I like to use this time of the year. What you wanna be looking for is getting it down deeper into the water where those fish are hanging out down lower. Once you start to see the bugs hatching and flying around in the sky, and you see fish heads popping out of the water in the calm spots, then you can start tying on a dry fly. But for me right now, what I like to use, and hopefully you guys can see this, bear with me if it's a little rough. Now this is a stone fly. This is called a two-bit hooker. That's just the fun name of it. It's got a couple tungsten beads on it. It's a stone fly representation. This is gonna sink pretty deep. So this is gonna get down in the rocks. Now behind that, Another prevalent bug right now is called a betis, which is a general term for a variation of a mayfly. Now this is a betis with a couple of tungsten beads. This is called a slim shady. The names are awfully kind of fun. Now if you want to fish two flies, this is a good setup. You can use a bigger bead fly up front, something smaller behind it. That's kind of the combination. If you want to go with three flies, you want to make sure you take off enough of your tippet. I'm using five and a half X trout hunter for this. I'm going to snip it right off. And I'm gonna tie that on to the bend of the hook on the second fly. Bear with me, everybody. I'm gonna do basically a clinch knot here. A clinch knot um, improvised a little bit. I'm gonna get it ready to go. I'm gonna grab that small betis. Now I'm adding a third fly. If you add three flies, the more times you add flies, the more chances you have for things going wrong. Like my knot just came unraveled there, but that's kind of normal for fly fishing, it happens. Really good fishing right now, everybody. I really recommend, uh, if you want to go out and try it, this is a great time of the year. There's plenty of water if you want to go in a boat and float down the river with an outfitter like the guys at Minturn Anglers. Uh, that's my crew over there at Minturn, and we do a great job. We got plenty of availability if you want to go out and test yourself on the river. Let's try this again and see if that knot won't come unraveled on me. There we go. Okay, so you get the knot nice and seated tight. You're gonna trim off that little piece of that tag material and don't drop it on the ground because it has a shelf life of about, half shelf life of about 100 years. That stuff will not decompose. All right, grab the other end of it now. The bug that I chose is a bat wing emerger. I don't know if you can see that. It's got the bluish kind of gray wings with a green body. That's gonna represent a blue wing olive, which is a type of fly that we have a lot of right now. It's a mayfly and we got a lot of them around, so that's nice to have too. Um, if I can get this through that little stinker eye of the hook here, let's see if it'll happen. You guys bear with me, everybody. Maybe it happened, maybe not. There it goes, we had it. Um, anyways, three flies triples your chances of catching fish, but it also triples your chances of having issues with knots and things like that, okay? So keep that in mind. It's, uh, it creates a lot of extra challenges. Tie that fly on there, the same knot, the clinch knot, loop it around five times, two, and then back through the original loop that you made. Make sure you wet it down before you sink it up just so you don't have that friction. Put it through there, clinch it off. I didn't wet it down, that's bad of me, but I'm gonna trim that little tag end off also and save it. Now I got three flies. I have that little bat wing emerger. I've got that betis. Then I have that bigger two-bit hooker to get everything down. Adjust your indicator accordingly, and you'll adjust your indicator a lot over the course of your fishing. And I would say look for any of that calmer water. Um, and there's a lot more calm water than there has been. The deeper pools, those fish will hang down deep. Midday, they're gonna shift and move up in the water column. But you wanna go and fish, give us a call at Minturn Angers, 970-827-9500. We'll take you out on the river and show you an experience like you've never had before. Oh, it's a lot of fun. Anyways, that's my quick fly fishing report. 
and it's only going to get better here in the Vail Valley. We'll be right back. Thank you, Mark. That's all the time we have for this episode of The Scoreboard. Now, remember, you can always find us online at thescoreboardnation.com. For the entire scoreboard team, I am Blake O'Rooley, and we will see you all next time.